Welcome to the second session on day two of our conference, COVID-19 Changing Culture. This session is the future of cultural labor. In this session, we will discuss which areas of the sector have been worst hit or are most at risk in the coming months and how we may retain and attract young, diverse talent to secure the future of the cultural workforce. We'll begin with some housekeeping. I'm the chair for this session. I'm Dr. Siobhan McAndrew, Senior Lecturer in Politics, Philosophy and Economics at University of Sheffield. I specialise in the study of cultural attitudes and cultural policy. If it helps you to mentalise, I am a white 43-year-old female with brown hair. I'm wearing a polka dot dress this morning. Sorry, a geometric dress this morning. I'd uh, like to invite the participants this morning to use the chat to introduce yourselves. Please go ahead. I'd also like to welcome and thank Trish, our live transcriber, for her services. You can access the live transcription via the stream text link shared in the chat. I'll now introduce our speakers. Each will be speaking for about five minutes in this plenary session. First, we have Dr. Dave O'Brien, Chancellor's Fellow in Cultural and Creative Industries at the University of Edinburgh. Secondly, we have Holly Maples, who's Senior Lecturer in Theatre at the University of Essex, who is presenting both as an academic and as a practitioner. Thirdly, we have Susie Henderson, Head of Creative Development at Contact Theatre in Manchester. And finally, Lily Geisendorfer, Director of Jowood Arts, the leading independent funder of artists in Britain. And they bring a wealth of expert insight. They'll be sharing short presentations from the research or experience responding to the topic of the future of cultural labour. And after the presentations, there'll be discussion and time to ask questions. You can post those in the Q&A section of the panel at the right hand side of your frame or by raising your hand and you can upvote on the questions so that the most popular can be identified. Okay, I'll now pass over to the speakers to introduce themselves with their own visual descriptions and they can then begin with their headline findings and their key points. Thanks Siobhan and uh, morning everybody. Uh, as Siobhan said, I'm Dr David Bryan. Uh, I'm a white man. I'm in the same age range as Siobhan um, and I'm wearing a black shirt uh, and I'm in uh, a white room, um, which is actually my, my living room. So I'm going to make, um, I think, four or five points um, that develop what Tal was saying this morning. I won't reiterate the statistics that he went through, but you should have in your minds that the pandemic saw a huge loss of hours, um, you know, really kind of across the board for, for most cultural and creative workers, um, although this was differently distributed according to demographics. Um, it saw huge numbers of job losses for particular parts of the creative economy, um, and particular demographic groups were more likely than others to be leaving most closely associated with uh, race and ethnicity, gender, disability, education and age. And I think across the day and a half we've had so far, we, we've heard uh, repeatedly a reference to the kind of turning up the dial on inequalities, the acceleration of uh, long-standing trends. And I think this is crucial to understanding any uh, questions of the future of um, creative labour and, and the cultural workforce. I think we need to take seriously that almost everything that's happened in the pandemic is almost not a sort of unusual or to an extent unexpected event, given what we know about how the workforce um, and how uh, the structure of our cultural industries are organised. These were long-standing problems and what's incredibly depressing as an academic is I don't think anybody working in this uh, space um, was at all surprised by what happened. You know, we, we might have been taken aback by, say, the magnitude, um, but certainly the kind of the dynamics were, were basically what we would have expected to happen, given what we know already. So that's one. I think really the social context matters here. And I think one thing on the future of cultural and creative labour is almost uh, not to ask about the creative or cultural workforce and to ask about the future of the workforce. So again, as, as we heard uh, this morning with, with uh, Pippa's work, I think it's, it's really crucial that actually many of the issues that um, caring uh, responsibilities um, 
throw up or, or um, kind of add on to existing issues for cultural and creative workers are issues that are not specific to cultural and creative work. They're actually issues specific to how the British economy and British society chooses or chooses not to support people with caring responsibilities. So the social context is really important and a kind of a better and fairer future for cultural labour. On the one hand, you know, what Arts Council England or Creative Scotland or, or whatever does is, is important. But really, I, I think what the pandemic has shown us is um, the sort of social conditions for cultural production um, are perhaps as crucial as any individual funding decision. This social context is allied to a historical context, and I, I might flag two uh, historical points. In some work that um, I've been doing with Mark Taylor and, and, and Orion Brook, with, with a little bit of assistance from Andrew Miles at the University of, of Manchester, we tried to chart what's been happening in terms of longer term inequalities using um, census data, effectively a, a kind of subset of census data to look at changes over time. And what's remarkable is in things like social class terms, inequalities have been really robust uh, for at least 40 years, which is uh, how long we, we've got decent uh, data for. But, you know, we, we would take an educated guess on, on this being an even longer term problem with the dominance of those from middle class origins. Some recent work in film on um, diversity initiatives in the film industry by Clive Nwonka from UCL and, and Sarita Malik from Brunel has demonstrated, I think, quite comprehensively that 20 years of diversity initiatives in the film sector have done little or nothing to change the uh, racial inequalities in, in Britain's film and, and to an extent television industries. So as much as we're dealing with a kind of uh, social context, um, we, we, we also need to, I think, historicize many of these debates. And, and somebody mentioned, I can't remember who it was, um, a comparison with uh, the Great Recession um, in 2008 and, and what happened uh, to the arts. I'm not going to offer a particularly kind of hopeful note, but I would flag um, some work that the All Party Parliamentary Group for Creative Diversity has been doing there creative majority report. And what was really, really interesting in that was both in terms of the academic literature, but also in terms of the evidence roundtable uh, sessions, it was really clear that the cultural and creative sector is extremely keen to change its working practices and to be fairer and more supportive, not exclusionary, whether in terms of um, who is appointed and commissioned or in more practical terms uh, in th thinking through, you know, kind of, um, individual employees or freelancers well-being for example but the thing that stood out from that um, kind of set of re recommendations and that process was the sense that we're still I think asking questions that are what is the one big trick or what is the one recommendation or what is the one policy that will solve all of these problems and I think for a fairer future for cultural labour, we need to be thinking much more in holistic and structural terms about a kind of possibly a broader social revolution around how Britain, Europe, perhaps the world is organised, because it's these kinds of fairer social settlements that will drive a fairer cultural sector. Thank you, Dave. We now pass on to Dr. Holly Maples at University of Essex. Hi, I'm Dr. Holly Maples. I am the primary investigator of Freelancers in the Dark, which is a UCRI ESR COVID-19 rapid response project, examining the social, cultural, and economic impact of COVID-19 on theater freelancers across the UK. And though I'm also a practitioner, I'm going to, for the sake of time, uh, talk primarily about this project. So began in uh, late July 2020, Freelancers in the Dark is a mixed methods qualitative study that includes 135 interviews, a survey, targeted focus groups, and creative micro commissions, all exploring the impact of COVID-19 on freelance theater workers across the country. And this includes researchers from the University of Essex, Manchester Metropolitan University, and Queen's University in Belfast. So over the time of the pandemic, we've seen significant changes to the way freelance theater workers think about their relationship to the industry. 
And uh, so this, this talk is going to concentrate on the very recent kind of thoughts and concerns of freelancers towards better working conditions and more inclusive practices within the, in the industry in our evolving COVID-19 world. And I would argue this isn't just to encourage young people to be a part of the industry, but also keep the older and more kind of seasoned practitioners in the industry who are sometimes dropping out because of precarity issues. So we just finished last week our creative micro commissions across the UK, which ended in Newcastle. These regional specific interdisciplinary creative workshops focused on themes which came up from our interviews, allowing artists to reflect creatively on their feelings about the experiences as arts workers throughout the pandemic and to foster dialogue over their thoughts on the future of the industry and the challenges for freelance artists in the future. So the workshops brought up concerns over diversity and inclusion practices in the industry, where many feel that there is a lip service to groups who are underrepresented, but these remain tokenistic or only seen on the surface, for example, on the stage, but not behind the scenes. So the question is, how do we make meaningful change for diversity and inclusion? And they felt that real change takes time and effort and also a change of the way the spaces work in terms of rehearsals and production and staffing in, in conversation and dialogue to make everybody feel included and have their points heard. And this is why diversity matters because it also will bring diversity to audiences. There's also a desire for better working conditions and better working hours. There's a feeling that the lack of regulation of pay makes many unable to sustain their work without juggling multiple projects or side jobs to sustain their practice. And then also the amount of either invisible labor or the lack of pay and prep time and project fees means that the hours people are actually doing on a project are below minimum wage in terms of the fee that they get. There was also a lot of criticism about how labor intensive the Arts Council grants are, which has been uh, um, a subject of a lot of the uh, deep dive discussions, and that there needs to be more transparent and supportive funding streams available for artists across the sector. Two positive things that happened over COVID-19 that workers hope will continue, but are afraid might go back to the pre-pandemic um, methods, which was many felt that there was a rise of industry support networks, both from organizations and from freelancers themselves, that has been incredibly positive, and that there's a worry that this will subside when the industry reopens and people get too busy to continue these dialogues and discussions and sharings. There was also a feeling that over COVID-19, people were allowed to be more human and the industry became more flexible and accommodating for people's issues and concerns. There was an open acknowledgement of the emotional struggles and the missing of deadlines during the pandemic, which illustrates the rigidity of pre-pandemic culture, which impacts freelancers' mental health and well-being by having to put their best self forward always and having non-changeable deadlines and a lack of flexibility towards work that is seen in other industries. So many felt the need to particularly make more flexible working hours to support, say, childcare or caring responsibilities or artists with disabilities that may make it difficult to work the kind of relentless eight to 12 hour days or six day weeks of the industry. And that flexibility and humanity needs to be brought in to the workers' lives as well as the type of work that they're celebrating in performance. Just as some of the artists spoke about in the first panel of the conference, the other thing many freelancers emphasized was the feeling of being undervalued by both the government and the public. And this has made them start paradoxically to value themselves more and to think about how they can stay true to their own values in the workforce. A desire for self-empowerment has created demands for structural change that allow this to happen. Many of our participants felt that there was a need for self-empowerment and more supportive relationships and structures in the industry to support the arts and society, to allow them to become more visible and them to be seen as more important. This theme, along with others, has drawn light over many arts workers' desire to fight for better working conditions across the sector. Communication and transparency were particular areas of improvement they wanted with Arts Council organizations and um, the organizations they work with, both in terms of the internal processing and the programming decisions. There was a feeling amongst many of our freelance research participants of being let down by some of the organizations during the pandemic and that there is a mistrust growing which needs time to heal. 
two members of our teams from Queen's University Belfast, Dr. Ali Fitzgibbons and Kurt Taroff, conducted organizational interviews to see their response to some of these freelancers' concerns. And they found that members of the organizations acknowledged the imperfections of their responses during COVID. However, they felt that there was a lack of understanding amongst freelancers of the challenges the organizations were dealing with. And many felt that they had been turned into a system rather than an organization run by a small bunch of people trying to do the best they could. Uh, so this ruptured trust in both directions. And they felt that this shouldn't be an us and them narrative, but the freelance workforce has to uh, collaborate and, and be seen to kind of communicate with arts organizations. And that in order to be a joint effort to make the performing arts healthy and thrive in the future and more resilient and allow for more of this kind of advocacy in the institutions. This is also somebody else has brought a um, sense of the need for universal income uh, uh, um, as they have in France for artists that also alleviate some of these um, kind of pressures on all sides. Um, and I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, that's fascinating. You know, so much has been learned over the course of this crisis and there's some really interesting ideas there for what could be taken forward. Thirdly, we uh, are delighted to welcome Susie Henderson, who is at the Contact Theatre in Manchester, and so she will be able to talk to us about her impressions uh, from an active theatre. Welcome, Susie. Hello, everybody. Um, yep, yeah, my name's Susie. I'm Head of Creative Development at Contact in Manchester which is a theatre and cultural organisation specialising in working with young people from 13 upwards, uh, with a real focus on young people as leaders and decision makers. <clears throat> I'm a white woman in my late 30s with white blonde hair in a short bob, brown eyes, and I'm wearing a black jumper today. The first thing to say, as already been said, I'm not an Africa academic. So what I'm going to say to you today is based on my direct experience of working with young people throughout the pandemic and before. I think, as many of us will know, young people have borne the brunt of this pandemic in many ways. For those young people living without long term health conditions, disabilities or other vulnerabilities, in many ways, they were at least risk at risk um, and yet gave up the most. Almost two years of their relatively short lives, missing vital opportunities and experiences. And we know that young people will continue to feel the impact of this pandemic for a long time to come yet. And I'm going to focus on talking about young people in terms of the future of our cultural labour market. Um, young people have been the hardest hit by the downturn in the labour market. Research carried out by the Institute for Employment found that under 24 year olds account for almost half of the total fall in employment. And for those young people from ethnic minority backgrounds, they're even more disproportionately affected. And those stats of the labour market as a whole. So when you consider many of the young people that we work with at Contact and through our national programme, the agency, we're already experiencing a range of challenges that mean entering the job market at all feels difficult enough, let alone thinking about entering the cultural job market. The pandemic has meant for many young people increased caring responsibilities, been un unable to access school and college learning because they don't have IT equipment, internet or data, disrupted sleeping patterns which have exasperated mental health conditions, social isolation, challenging family dynamics and relationships. And it's the combination of all these things coupled with the arts and cultural sectors being perceived as risky career choices available to only those with existing connections or the support systems that would allow them to do unpaid voluntary work. It makes it feel like a really unobtainable dream for many young people. And when you consider the current makeup of our cultural sector, especially when you look at those in leadership roles and the pressing need to diversify the people leading our cultural institutions, then all those challenges facing our brilliant, brilliant potential future leaders, it can feel really depressing. So what, what can we do and what is being done? So the first thing I want to say is that free is not enough. It's great that many cultural organisations offer brilliant free participatory and engagement programmes, work experience placements, but actually we need to go beyond that. I had a conversation with a young man just last week who told me he wasn't going to apply for a work experience placement at a cultural venue because the bus would cost 70p every day to get there. We need to be really clear from the outset about covering travel costs for young people to attend opportunities. 
it's really difficult for anyone to talk about financial barriers that they might face, let alone a young person. So make this really clear up front. And if you don't have to mean test something, we're not the government, don't do it. If someone tells you they need their travel covered, then they really probably do. Make that a really easy conversation to have. Have it with everybody. Paid opportunities. Really think about where you can create paid opportunities. The agency, which is the national programme we co-lead with Battersea Arts Centre, supports young people to develop their own socially engaged projects. And those participants on that programme get £25 of expenses every week. That makes a huge difference to who accesses that programme and the ability for them to stay on the programme for the full 28 weeks that it runs. Create paid trainee and assistant roles on your projects and make those explicit, clear progression routes for the young people on your engagement programmes. That's not only going to benefit them, it's also going to benefit you. That role modelling for other young people to see that these pathways are open to them and not some long time in the future, but literally maybe a year or so after finishing their project with you, helps them to start to see what might be possible for them. Look at your recruitment practices, value alternative experience, don't ask for formal qualifications unless you really need them. And do you really need them apart from maybe a head of finance? Change how you talk about jobs. What the hell is a front of house team? Who knows what a producer does? All these roles really need great people with great transferable skills who are good with others. Say that instead when you're looking for your staff. Use your networks. Pay young people. Um, we pay young people who've been part of projects to be part of street teams that do outreach work um, and engagement work for us. They are the best advocates within their own communities to talk about contact what it has to offer, why you might want to come here, whether that's to see a show, get a job or join a project. Pay young people to be part of your interview panels. It's a win-win situation. They're going to help you select the best staff. They're going to give you an alternative perspective on who you should employ. And it also demystifies the interview and recruitment processes for them. Helps them to understand what interviewers are looking for, how they could present themselves. And finally, put them on your boards, give young people power, give them a seat at the table and allow them to inform the decisions and watch what that happens and what does for your organisations and how that changes who your audiences are, your participants are and your employees are. Thank you. Thank you. I can see there's lots of applause and lots of love you know, for these suggestions for a better future for the sector. Finally, we have Lily Geisendorfer, who is Director of Jerwood Arts, and she'll be speaking to us for about five minutes on her perspective from the funding side. Welcome, Lily. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Director at Jerwood Arts. We're the leading funder of early career artists, creators and producers in the UK. I'm a white woman with green eyes and tied back hair, bright yellow earrings. I'm wearing a fair isle jumper with a blue design and um, behind me it's quite dark you can make out a bookcase over my left shoulder hello um so i'm not an academic either um but i'm going to highlight three things that we've noticed at jerwood arts about how the pandemic has impacted individual artists producers and curators the vast majority of whom are independent freelancers and I hope these observations will prompt some different perspectives on the challenges and opportunities they might create when thinking about how to create a more sustainable future. So when we surveyed over 1,200 applicants to our live work fund last October, what artists seem to appreciate most about the changed culture of the sector since the start of the pandemic wasn't any specific actions or initiatives, but the greater sense of kindness and humanity in the way that people from all parts of the sector have treated each other more generally. I quote, I have seen greater compassion and flexibility in the sector for people's immediate circumstances and a desire to adapt and make work around what's possible for artists right now. I want that to continue until we have working structures that work for everyone and enable artists often excluded by their circumstances caregivers, artists with disabilities, artists from more economically deprived backgrounds, etc., to work without fear, they'll be discounted. And that was a Northern Ireland based artist. The first thing I want to highlight is the role of agency um, in different creative practices. So different artistic occupations and disciplines have different levels of agency over their creative work. 
and therefore their ability to adapt to something as seismic as the impact of a pandemic. For example, actors and musicians have relative lack of agency in their creative processes and for finding it much, much harder to pivot, as the word was. Whereas theatre directors, what we saw was a lot more pivoting and adapting and continuing to be able to make work and take a proactive role in how they would sustain their practices. So agency is a facet of power. And what's become clear is that we need to think about how different creative occupations inherently have more or less power in the creative process and therefore over their livelihoods. My second point is about valuing new ways of working in the digital space. We've all adapted to working in online spaces, but some artists, curators and producers have become real specialists and experts in that space. They're now brilliant at delivering and facilitating creative processes and digital ways of making as they were once offline, and in some cases have even found their forte in the online space. So there's a huge new workforce of artists and creatives that need this work to be recognized and valued and supported on equal terms. Digital spaces can be non-hierarchical and non-institutional in a way that physical spaces rarely are. They offer access and reach in a way that physical spaces rarely can. So how do we make sure when we think about the artists, producers and curators of the future, we include these types of labor on an equal footing? My third point is that to secure a more equal and sustainable future creative workforce, we need to support potential, not achievements. What do I mean by this? Well, as a funder, I feel we really need to support artists and creatives' potential and ideas and not wait for them to create in the margins self-exploiting before we bestow recognition, money and status. So our awards and fellowships and the opportunities we offer have been exploring how to do this better for some time. And if uh, I can have my slides up, um, I can give you a recent example. Um, this first slide shows the three Gerard Compton Poetry Fellows who we announced um, about three weeks ago. Um, and that's a programme that offers £15,000 and 12 months, 12 months of wraparound support without the expectation of any fixed outcomes. These poets have been working tirelessly for their communities throughout the pandemic, often with absolutely zero further support. And the award is really about recognising the role that they play on invisible to so much of the sector and giving them a bit of a sustainable footing. So these models of um, sit alongside discussions for UBI and a national portfolio of artists, and they speak to the need to recognize invisible labor that artists put into their craft and skills, into generating new work, building relationships and net networks long before any money is ever attached to a project. My last observation, next slide, is that the pandemic has already showed us just how radical, uh, how up for radical change artists are. I'm just going to highlight one example in 30 seconds. This is NTD Broadgate. It's the bra brainchild of New Diorama Theatre, and it's a floor plan of 27 rehearsal and design spaces, which are available for a whole year for free to theatre and performance makers. It's untapped potential of partnerships that I want to highlight here. So this is the commercial sector, British Land, City of London Corporation, making space available for free to support artists to return to making work in real life together. There's an old adage that artists just need time, space and money. They're exceptionally innovative in how they go about finding these. But the pandemic has exposed the weak links and imbalances between them like nothing before. So when we're thinking about the future of creative labour, I think we need to go be radical, not just about money and pay, but also about the conditions artists are working in and the power their practice gives them. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. It's extremely interesting. And your four points, firstly, about agency. Secondly, the new ways of working that the sector has discovered. Thirdly, the importance of recognizing promise rather than record. And finally, the opportunities for radical change. Those are really important takeaways. It's now time for us to open up the discussion, uh, taking the lead from questions from our audience. I'll open up with the most popular two, which seem to be quite closely related. So firstly, Miriam Kramer at 
OCAD University in Ontario has said, what are some of the changes of big policy ideas that we can implement to facilitate these changes? And following that, Trevor McFarlane asked, Trevor McFarlane from Cultural Commons, a new social settlement is clearly optimal, but it could take some time. So what can we do immediately? I think those are two excellent questions. So what does the panel think? Who would like to begin? I mean, I, I can just say all of the things we heard from Susie, um, you know, were exactly the kinds of um, steps that organisations can take. And, and they echoed, I think I put this into the chat, they echoed so much of um, what we found with, with the APPG work as well. Um, I guess, you know, on, on a big level, Susie, you were describing like not for contact, a reorientation of the organisation, because this is contact's tradition, isn't it? But for organisations that are not like contact, which is basically most other arts organisations, there is a kind of reorientation of what the organisation is there to do, who it's there to serve, and things tend to flow from that in terms of, yeah, precisely little um, changes that can be really major, actually. So again, thinking about your comment, Susie, about paying young people to be on um, interview panels, for many arts organisations, that requires quite a major structural change to like how they pay people, who they count as like legitimate actors to be on an interview panel. And it's through those, you know, seemingly kind of like small things that you get, you know, possibly kind of major organisational changes. That said, though, like, you know, Trevor's question about it's all very well saying we need a different Britain and that will solve all the problems. But what do we do now? Um, and uh, Miriam's question, you know, we'll, we'll, what kind of changes and ideas do, do we need? I, I am really cautious on this because what we found with, with the APPG work, and actually there's a lot of other research on this, is organisations tend to kind of ask these questions as a way of saying, tell us the one thing we need to do, we'll do it, and that will solve the problems. And rather than saying, you know, particularly in, in terms of responding to structural inequalities, these things are dynamic, they take a long time to change, you, you know, we can't just do one thing and consider it solved. My fear with the kind of, you know, tell us that the thing to do is we'll see a repeat of what happened sort of five or six years ago, which was organisations basically said, unconscious bias training will be, you know, the kind of the route to solving all problems, we'll roll that out and that's it, that's settled. It's clear that it has, you know, some good points, some bad points, there, there are issues with it, you know, it works in some circumstances, but it certainly shouldn't have been used as the only, you know, magic trick to deal with inequality. Dr Maples, have you any points or suggestions for immediate policy changes, immediate measures that could be introduced? Um, in, in terms of policy changes, uh, I mean, obviously more funding in the arts is, is a way to get uh, kind of more inclusion in the sector. But in terms of the way arts organizations can perhaps change their practices, fostering more dialogue and communication, bringing more diverse artists together and other kind of theater makers, making structures that can work for people, but asking the people what is, is the benefit for them rather than deciding for them, I think really can create meaningful change. Um, what a lot of people have discussed is, is this feeling sometimes, especially for say working class or um, particular kinds of um, communities that feel they aren't represented in institutions is those institutions aren't for them. And they don't feel comfortable in those spaces. They don't feel like they reflect what um, their lived realities are. And then that's hard to change the audiences also. So rather than deciding how to change that, maybe getting people in and seeing, you know, and they can be very simple things like how do we speak in these spaces? How do we move? Rather than making people have to, in some ways, expect that the universal norm is a middle-class way of behaving that's able-bodied, for example, right? Um, so how can we actually fully radically transform the way we speak, the way we organize kind of work and, and the way we kind of create work inside organizations? I also think one thing that a lot of people have talked about was over the COVID, um, the Arts Council made um, some funding uh, availability that wasn't project oriented, but was giving people money for a year to or two years to do work, these kind of creative practice grants. And I think arts organizations can do that too, rather than just bring them in for an R&D and then you never see them again. How do we kind of foster actually a, a, a relationship that is continuing, that isn't feeling like, okay, we've ticked that box, goodbye. 
and then we're still going to hire the same people we hire all the time, right? You know, how do we actually make more um, fluidity in, in, and support for the long term for local artists, for um, diverse artists, for also people so that we can kind of benefit each other and people can kind of learn from networks together. So for me, I, I think communication and support and development that is actually meaningful and to actually look to your own practices and see you have to change the way what you think it, that there is no norm, that there is diverse experiences and thoughts and ideas and that we need to celebrate that. Thank you. Uh Susie Henderson, from a creative development perspective, you've talked so compellingly about what you experienced in contact theatre. Would it be possible or uh, for small organisations, maybe those with you know less capacity to change quickly, you know, to do similar things and what could help them to do that? So what broader policy or ecosystem uh, changes, you know, might be needed, you know, to make things better more broadly? Yeah, I, th I think absolutely. I think everyone is able to make some changes within the structures that they have in their organisation. I think a lot of what Holly was just saying is about thinking about it's not just uh, how you diversify the people in your organisation. If what you're doing is asking them to assimilate into a structure that has been built based on a white, able bodied, middle class, upper class person and their life experience and how they work and how their life is likely to be, because that that's just not going to work. Either they'll assimilate and you'll get nothing, you'll just get groupthink to continue, or they'll leave because that is not going to be an accessible way for them to work. So it's, I think it's, it's making sure that I guess before you do something, you are thinking about what that what that means for you as an organisation. And I really think it's about having having that having that organisational buy in and and really. Um, you know, making sure that you're ready for it, I guess. I think Joe would be brilliant at that with the work that they do with organisations around taking um, young people into, into those spaces and the support that they provide as well as an external, I guess, uh, organisation and bringing that group together to share that because it's, it's difficult, especially if you're talking about only taking one person who's going to be different into a space of people that are all the same, That who wants to be that person? So I think it's really thinking about, yeah, what what are the ways of how you work that might be barriers that you've not even considered yet that before you then bring somebody into that space and expect them to thrive? Thank you. And I'll bring in Lily, Lily Geisendorfer, as uh, from the funder perspective, there have been some questions asked about whether Thank different you. social welfare systems, you know, might you know be useful as well. So Abby Gilmore at the University of Manchester has asked, what are the pros and cons of an art, arts or culture social welfare system? Is there a case for an artist basic income or would a universal basic income work better? I think at one point, you know, the panel also referred to a national portfolio of artists. You know, so, you know, what what might work, you know, what might you know, help the sector in all its diversity? It's a brilliant question. I think there's some really lively debates on um, the value of this. I, I, I sort of feel like it's 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 not going to happen. And, and I was just thinking about if there was one point that I feel is by something that could be advocated to government, um, to, uh, to funders and to all organisations that could do something right now it's actually to to kind of end the unpaid and invisible labor uh, that is propping up the whole of the ecology at the moment so i think we've run some really great campaigns against unpaid internships and there are you know there's a much better recognition around fair pay um, and minimum wage and those things have started to get better traction but i think we're still and i speak as a, as a funder, we're still quite capable of overlooking the true value of unpaid work that's going into just uh, preparing for facilitate for, for preparing for work, preparing for presentations, um, the thinking and research, the relationship building and networking. And I think organisations could do a lot better in terms of um, stamping out and paying properly. Uh, the, the the work that freelancers and, and artists are doing. 
Um, so I feel like there's more we could be doing there to recognise where invisible labour is happening and um, and paying it appropriately using existing legislation that's that's out there. But also things like um, triple, uh, you know, we have kind of uh, triple bottom line budgeting to bring in the environmental costs and, and show kind of the true costs of um, of work that we might be doing. And is could we be doing kind of coming up with some templates and ways of thinking that show the true cost of the um, talent and, and artistic thinking that's going into work? Um, so, yeah, I think that that feels like something um, around pay and um, sort of just getting basic pay right <laughs> that I would really like to see more more done on. So thank you. We've also had a question from Nina White at the Paul Hamlin Foundation. She says, says that as Dave inferred, research in this area has confirmed much of what we have known for a long time with little in the way of progress. Who isn't listening? Is it government, funders, organisations and why? I might begin now with Lily again. <laughs> she seems uh, well positioned uh, to respond from the funding perspective you know, before uh, yeah. going back to the rest of the panel. It's, it is really quite, um, I mean, Dave always says, you know, I don't want to be too depressing about this, but it is really depressing. Um, Jailwood Arts has been running a programme specifically about social mobility in the arts for a decade. And of course, it's just one small programme it's not going to make um, you know systemic change. You're not going to see, necessarily see that, but it is. It has been really um, sobering to us uh, that it, there has been so little change, and actually now it's going backwards um, in terms of who's working in the arts. Um, it feels like more people are listening, but it's so difficult to kind of beyond your anecdotal bubbles um, that we work in to really know. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I'd really love Dave's perspective on this um, because I feel like there is definitely more listening happening. I, th I think possibly some of the changes that, you know, even the changes that Susie was talking about, very practical, seemingly easy things to do are actually a lot harder. Um, our work with trying to change organisational cultures to be more inclusive and thinking about really carefully about how do you welcome in difference and um you know there's something about both access in but then retaining talent um that we're not i don't think we're doing very well on yet um or well enough on so i think we might be listening but we're not translating that with our practice is not yet shifting significantly enough um thank you uh holly maples you're just a above Lily on my screen. So I'll come to you next. What are your thoughts um, on yeah. business for spaces and possibilities for change? Well, I think one thing that I found quite exciting, it is very interesting to actually see over time and speaking to some of the freelancers who've been in the industry for 40 years, really seeing the kind of reduction, especially after the 80s of, of, um, of funding of government support, of, of a feeling of valuing community-based and local work and, and um, you know, kind of taking the hemorrhaging of money from local communities, from education, from the arts, um, which has been kind of a tragedy. But uh, but one thing I found kind of exciting over this time for a lot of the freelance um, workforce, uh, I, I think you're so there's such a kind of system of precarity and scarcity that a lot of people felt quite competitive to each other, and also the kind of constant hustle of work just made you get on with it and um, accept. Uh, certain levels of, um, you know, begin to exploit yourself in some ways in the industry, except the kind of labor conditions. And I do feel that over COVID-19, there has been a move towards not only collective action, but feeling of a lot of freelancers as a, as a group that can lobby and really thinking about how do you push back? How do you kind of uh, create change from within as well? And, and that it should not, and there also is a feeling that it shouldn't be on the freelance workforce to make that change, but also that there is a kind of rise of advocacy, which means it's a rise of visibility, and that has been a pushback. We've seen that also in the hospitality industry and other industries and in, in, um, in a kind of post-COVID workforce. I also feel that the kind of movement of Black Lives Matter, of Me Too, has moved a, um, a different kind of way of thinking about some of the, not only inequality, but abuse in the industry that people are using social media as a platform to change, to kind of 
uh, shout out against certain bad practices that have been open secrets in the industry for years that people have had to just take. So I do feel we're at a cultural moment that is quite exciting where people are pushing back and that will create change. Um, and maybe not as much change as we would like and you still need more resources. And just as Lily was saying, the regulation of ours, but I had one lighting designer, for example, who had a spreadsheet of the exact amount of work he did and the pay he got over the past five years to show how little it was. And um, I think things like this, the sharing of that amongst amongst the workforce has also raised uh, people's sense of um, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, what is collective abuse and not just a single person's experience and how that can mobilize action. Wonderful. It's great to hear reasons in optimism. I know from you know, the projects I've done that you know, so much is invisible in the system. We don't see uh, unpaid work or volunteer, volunteer effort clearly in many organizational accounts, for example. So, so much is just not counted. And the problem then is that it might not count. There is uh, an excellent question, which is now at the top of the list, which I, I'm saving now for both Dave and Susie from Sarah Scarsbrook at the University of the Creative Arts. As class is not a protected characteristic in EDI policy, and I think it's not protected in the Equalities Act either, is it? So how do we in the cultural sector address class and equality in the workforce? And how might this impact cultural production and consumption? Susie. It's not a protected characteristic, but it doesn't mean that you as an organisation are not able to try and measure that and look at that. And I do think from uh, conversations with Arts Council that it possibly will be something that they're going to start measuring. They're already measuring it now for staff workforce surveys. Um, I, f I do find it problematic how we measure it. I, again, Joe would have done some brilliant work on this around class. Uh, it's not very useful to me for me to ask some of the young people that I work with what did the primary uh, breadwinner in your uh, household do when you were 14 when there isn't a um, a box for uh, was, a, was a very successful criminal I had a lot of money or actually they were retired because I'm the last of many children and you know it doesn't necessarily capture for me the current lots of the current methods uh, for for really understanding somebody's background but um, I do think that it is an important thing for us to be really really looking at um, and yeah, but yeah, I would encourage people to start looking at it, whether or not it is covered. And uh, certainly at Contact, we have our own Equality Diversity Action Plan and class or um, economic background, or however you want to describe it, is definitely one of the things that we look at and try and measure. Holly, did I see a signal from you before yeah. I moved today? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm quite actually uh, impassioned about this particular issue. Um, I've done quite a number of interviews with working class artists, and there is a really interesting working class artists um, uh, group on Twitter who've also kind of started to kind of really mobilize and really think about class. Um, I, I think also it, it's, it's difficult. There's intersectional issues around class. There's also the feeling that sometimes it is a hidden um, uh, um, as opposed to on the surface, like like um, other types of diversity kind of needs are sometimes where you really see the, the difference or the lack of in, in that kind of way. And, and again, these kind of fights for meaningful dialogue, for not making poverty porn, for um, really not having a uh, paternalistic, shall we say, view on what class is or how you represent and truly kind of enable artists. And then also what was interesting with a lot of the people that I've spoken to, they very much are, are, are a lot of the kind of working class artists I've talked to are very much impassioned by promoting and encouraging people within their own community and also kind of building up forces. But there has been a lot of worry around the kind of deprivation of education, the kind of cutting of arts from schools as well and other types of youth programs that that was the way that they got, um, were able to kind of get into the arts. And, and like um, Susie was talking about these issues around unpaid labor and, and other types of ways, how do you encourage, how do you have apprenticeships? Um, for example, one uh, Manchester set designer who's been in the industry for 40 years said that he would never have been in the industry now had it not had the kind of regional rep system then, which allowed for a paid apprenticeship and that's how he was able to get into the industry and see it as an actual possible profession and also then build his expertise up and he left school at 16 and, and went into set design and or, or set build at that time 
and then never left the profession. Um, but I do think that it needs to be something can, considered and, and also that there isn't just one type of working class. There's different you know, kinds of issues within uh, the industry, the benefits class, you know, other types of ways. And what does this become and how, how do we actually look at the nuance of that and how it also has ricochet effects on caring responsibilities, on health issues, on other types of issues within that, that um, uh, I think it's very, very sad that it's not a um, protected characteristic. Yeah. Thank you. So Dave, thoughts on class? Yeah, just, just very quickly. Uh, I, I think measurement is fascinating because it, it, it kind of brings up the differences between, I suppose, what academics are sort of, you know, kind of comfortable and interested in, in terms of using techniques um, that tell us quite a lot about, you know, big populations and, you know, entire society, societies and how they're split up and stratified versus the absolutely, you know, central and, and crucially important sense of individuals having a relationship with an arts organisation that they want to feel um, essentially kind of recognised by. Um, and the idea of, you know, your opening interaction with an organisation being the organisation giving you, you know, survey materials that immediately say we don't recognise or, um, you know, offer you a space or a place with our survey material can be, you know, quite an alienating experience. And I, and I think on that, um, the stuff that Susan uh, Oman was was doing um, in terms of working with the Arts Council and, and basically doing focus groups to kind of think through why measures are around and why measures, you know, can't kind of exist. Um, so stuff like, you know, parental occupation, parental occupation as a proxy to try and think about, you know, the kind of social starting point for an individual. Um, and there are many ways of asking about social starting points. Uh, there are many, you know, there's a range of, of, of kind of questions that academics are comfortable with. Um, there are a range of, you know, sub questions. Um, and I think it's more the kind of the sense of explaining to people where these questions are coming from, why they're they're being used. So to pick up on something, Holly, uh, you, you'd mentioned, and and actually, Susie, your you know your point about young people who um, are from you know maybe they've got grandparents, not parents, or you know uh, comparatively wealthy backgrounds from uh, slightly nefarious means, for for example. The mirror image of this is found for people from you know quite affluent whether upper upper you know upper middle aristocratic posh backgrounds who can react quite badly to the idea of what my parent did for a living has somehow determined my success um, and the kind of complexity of my life is not recognized so yeah you, you know basically like everybody hates these questions um, as, as a rule um, and I think one of the comments was around the kind of peculiar Britishness and, and there are definitely kind of issues about how this maps on to um, people who are, whether they're recent immigrants or, um, you know, perhaps first generation uh, or even second generation immigrants as well. So there are lots of kind of complexities. And I think the worst thing an organisation can do in terms of the class stuff is basically say, we've just taken a question off the shelf. We don't really understand why we're asking it, but we think, and I keep e echoing this, we think it's the one way to solve the class question that we have. So we're just going to do it. And it's, you know, kind of working through processes of why you're asking questions, why you're collecting data, what you're doing with the data is really important. Now, just very briefly, there was a kind of second half to that question, which was what difference will this make? Um, and as someone who studied, you know, cultural consumption patterns over time, uh, it's clear that having a really, you know, rich and nuanced understanding of people's gender, race, their educational backgrounds has made little or no difference whatsoever to the stratification of cultural consumption. So who goes, who is represented, et cetera, in Britain? Certainly, if you look at the DCMS data over 20 years, if not 30. So I think just knowing is not enough. And again, you know, Susie and Holly, and, and actually stuff, Lily, you've been saying, it's, you know, it's not so much the just knowing, it's, you know, what do you do with the knowing? You know, how do you kind of change on the back of it? Excellent, thank you. And we have, still have some excellent questions, uh, which is really encouraging for the deep dive, which will be following this session. But there's one which has particularly struck me from Kate Mc, uh, McBain, uh, a freelancer. How should we be engaging future cultural workers in these conversations? I think I've selected this because of 
my field and because I teach university students, I'm often asked, you know, by my students or recent graduates or family friends, you know, what they should go into. And they say, I really want to go into the arts. And on the one hand, I feel a strong sense of joy for them that they found their vocation and this is what they want to do. And on the other hand, thinking, oh, my goodness, it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge. You know, there may be a hard road ahead. And so she goes on to say, students of arts creative industries practice post pandemic seem to be approaching their passage from higher education to industry with a new type of skepticism and urgency and expectancy. So what does the panel think? How should we be talking about this with emerging cultural workers? And I suppose from my point of view, you know, you know should, we, should we be encouraging them to enter the field at this point in time? I suppose I'll just say one thing, actually, as an artist. <laughs> I, I trained at Central School of Speech and Drama, BA acting, and went into the industry. And I, we were taught nothing of the industry. Nothing besides, you know, get an agent, you know, you'll get in the kind of work at the kind of high end. Like the idea of like even taxes. I mean, I think the higher education and drama schools and art schools need to teach business practices, need to teach how to negotiate need to teach about work, need to show the kind of labor, get people in who are workers at across all levels of the industry, not just this um, idea that uh, you're all gonna, you know, uh, that, that it has nothing to do with teaching the practice and or say the academic kind of side of it, which also happens because people will want to go into the industry, you know, so we just need to equip them as much as we can with as many resources and knowledge and information. Even a lot of the people I interviewed, they've said passionately, to be an artist is more than just about the, the, the making of the money. So a lot of people think, oh, I'm not in it for the money, but they, they need the money to live. They need the money to, you know, to thrive and to feel the kind of value. So that shouldn't be a bad word. I think we need to remember it's a business as well as a practice of identity. And the more that we can equip people with as much knowledge as possible with the way the actual industry runs, the better off they will be to also change the industry. And not just like uh, like we came out and a lot of people ended up on Prozac and lithium for a couple of years because they were not equipped to deal. And then eventually they got over that and, and continued working and developing. But the only way often was through other freelancers telling you and teaching you what to do and a kind of lived practice and experience and trial and error. So for me, it's knowledge is power. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I couldn't agree more. And it's, you know, sort of fascinating and depressing how struggles over curricula are deeply embedded in the inequalities we see in, in the sector and really basic things like, you know, you will have to do a tax return. Here's how you do it. You will have to get an accountant. Here's how to spot an accountant who's likely to rip you off and mean that you cease trading within two years because you haven't paid your VAT. Or, you know, all of this kind of stuff, which just things are changing in particular institutions. And, and you know, I noticed Bruce mentioned in fine arts, but actually this is true right across drama courses. Certainly it's true, in, you know, to be really kind of blunt about it. The kind of institutions that provide the bedrock for things like TV commissioning, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, the major London institutions um, are, are not putting here's how you become a creative entrepreneur onto an English lit degree, for example, in some ways, nor should they. But on the other hand, you know, we do have to have these questions about if we're going to have our higher education institutions tell stories about routes into the creative economy, we should, you know, really take seriously what those routes should be and what's needed. Thank you, Dave. Um, and thank you to the audience for those extremely interesting and insightful questions. I think we have to draw to a close on the panel. Thank you to the panel members, to Dave O'Brien, Holly Maple, Sully Geisendorfer, and to Susie Henderson. I gather that in five minutes, we're going to be moving to deep dive tables to continue the conversation because I think there is so much more to talk about. And if I remember rightly, that what Dave O'Brien and Susie Henderson will be at one table, Holly Maple, Sully Geisendorfer at another. I may float between the two because they both sound fascinating. Otherwise, if you want to branch out, you can also join a discussion on running a large scale mixed methods research project led by CCV researchers, Centre for Cultural Value researchers. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. There are more panels to come, table talks, networking opportunities and so on. Please look out for the feedback survey at the end of the conference. And also thank you to our live captioner, Trish, and her excellent work. And again, big thanks to our speakers. 
and I'll hopefully see some of you shortly. Goodbye.